Ladies and gentlemen, the President and First Lady of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and please be seated and welcome to the White House Conference on Child Care. Uh, we are delighted to have with us in the East Room today members of Congress and the President's Cabinet, other officials from the government here in Washington. Uh, we have many elected officials from around the country and a great group of distinguished guests, including parents and experts uh, in this important issue. I also want to greet the hundreds of people gathered at the Departments of Agriculture, Labor, and Health and Human Services here in Washington, and to the thousands more who are joining us via satellite from the more than 100 sites at universities, hospitals, and schools and businesses around the country. I'd like to take a minute for all of us to think about what's happening in America this morning and about what happens every morning. Parents are making the preparations to get to work, and those preparations include for most working families, uh, putting their children in the care of others. And most, even before they're out the door, are worrying about the logistics of the care that their children will receive. Some are even worrying about the safety or quality of that care. There are many who are wondering whether they would get better quality care if they could pay more. Others are struggling to determine how they'll be able to afford next month's payment. And there are many who are in the workforce who worry every day about how they'll care for their child and hold down the job that they need. Many parents will go to work but have trouble focusing on work because they are worried about the sniffle that their daughter had or wondering how their son is faring. And before we finish today, many more working parents will keep looking anxiously at the clock and will murmur into telephones uh, the instructions that their children need uh, after school because their concerns don't end uh, at the end of the day for their children's school time because parents won't get home uh, so that they have to worry about what happens to keep their child safe and well occupied during those hours as well. These are just some of the questions that America's parents are asking themselves this morning and every morning that they prepare to go to work. Some parents ask themselves these questions in the afternoon as they prepare to go to a swing shift or at midnight as they start to work uh, in one of the other jobs that are essential to keeping our economy strong. Earlier this month, I went to the University of Maryland to visit its Center for Young Children, and as soon as I walked in the door, I knew immediately it was the kind of place any of us would feel comfortable sending our children. I was frankly tempted to sign up myself. Uh, the walls were painted bright colors, there was lots of natural light, the workers there were creative, energetic, and focused. Inside there were toys and crafts material, outside there was a playground, and the children looked happy and occupied and full of energy. Now, later I left the center to make a speech, and after the speech, I opened the floor to questions, and the very first question was one that I thought summed up the dilemma that we face today. It came from a divorced mother who works full-time as a secretary at the university. To send her four-year-old son to the center I had visited, she told me, would cost $6,000 a year, a quarter of her income, and she just couldn't do it. She had to do some real juggling to get the situation that she told me about. 
She was able to send her son to another less expensive center because she qualified for a scholarship and she moved back in with her parents. Otherwise, she said, I would have to quit my job and go on welfare. And then I would have to worry about who would watch my child as I looked for a job. She and so many women like her are the reason we are here today. And parents like Paula Brolio, who's here with us in the East Room, represent the millions of parents who worry about this important issue. 13 million American children spend all or some of their day being cared for by someone other than their parent. Yet a recent national study found that child care at most centers in our country is, quote, poor to mediocre with almost half of the infants and toddlers in rooms having less than minimal quality. The study also concluded that fully 40% of the rooms serving infants in centers provided care that was of such poor quality as to jeopardize children's health, safety, or development. A recent University of Colorado at Denver survey of child care in four states found only one in seven child care centers to be of good quality. And quality care, as Paula and so many others know, when it is available is often financially out of reach. According to the 1995 census, families earning under $1,200 a month or less than $15,000 a year pay an average of 25% of their income for child care. Middle class families are hit hard as well. These families earning up to $36,000 a year pay 12% of their income for child care. The urgency of this conference today to focus on child care is heightened by the new scientific information we have about the emotional and intellectual development of young children. As we learned at the White House Conference on Early Childhood Development in April, what happens to a child in the earliest years affects how well he or she learns for a lifetime. With 45% of our children under the age of one in daycare regularly, the issue of quality has tremendous bearing, not just on individual lives, but on the future of our nation. What's more, we now know from other studies that good care, whether given at home or in a daycare setting, is good care. Done right, daycare can be beneficial for children, and it is therefore worth our investment. There's another reason that compels us to act, and that is demand. Demand for quality child care is growing, hastened on by our new economy, which has meant in the last 40 years dramatic changes in the American workforce and in the American family's life. We know, for example, that half of all mothers with children under one year of age are working outside the home, and not only are more parents working, they are working longer hours. Also, with welfare reform, we know that many more children will be needing quality child care. So this conference is meant to start a conversation. It is only one day, but we hope it is a day that will renew our efforts to improve child care in America. We also hope it will involve our entire national community, because every aspect of our life together must be involved in looking for solutions. The federal government has a role to play, but so do state governments, business and labor, the nonprofit and religious communities, school systems, individual citizens, and especially parents. We also know there are models of excellent child care around the country, and we will hear about some of them, like the military's daycare system or the Smart Start program in North Carolina. These initiatives provide examples of best practices and can energize and inspire us to do more. We also know how important it is to ensure choice for parents in their selection of child care. One size fits all child care does not fit America's families. We don't work the same hours, we don't have the same economic or other kinds of pressures that we're dealing with, so we have to provide more options and we have to empower parents with good information to enable them to become good consumers. 
We also have to find ways that would make it easier and more affordable for parents who want to stay home with their children for some period of time to be able to afford to do so. So I hope we approach this conversation with a certain fearlessness, uh, with the same kind of energy that I see on the face of a three or four year old who's going about some task that he knows will occupy himself. We need to have the same kind of fearless approach, asking the hard questions and then listening to the answers. There will be a lot of questions raised today, questions about how to ensure the safety of every child in childcare, how to do a better job of training and paying caregivers, how to encourage more employers to provide childcare benefits of some variety to employees, how to make successful after-school programs more widely available, how to meet the needs of children with disabilities, how to better support parents who choose, often at significant cost, to stay home with their children, how to ensure that quality and affordability do not come at the expense of one another, and how to learn from the good models that we have in every community and state of our country. And also, how do we leave ideology at the door and honestly address the real needs of America's families? These are tough questions and there are many more that we will be considering today. But we consider these questions at an opportune time. And we hope that this conference will spur the conversations around kitchen tables and water coolers and standing in supermarket aisles or at soccer games or while going to or from work in the carpool, whatever it takes to engage more Americans in this discussion to make it clear that we want American parents to succeed at the most important task they have, caring for the next generation and to be good workers who contribute to the economy and the quality of life that we enjoy in our country. Now I'd like to address your attention to a video produced by New Screen Concepts in association with the Families and Work Institute entitled, Why Should We Care About Child Care? Having a child, and in our case two children, and trying to maintain our careers is literally like a house of cards. If I feel like the kids are not in a good environment, I cannot work. There's always something running through the back of my mind. What's he doing now? What are they teaching him now? Without quality childcare, I have no idea how I'd make it. During the first few years of life, the brain grows very rapidly, and the connections that are going to be in place permanently will really depend upon the quality of the environmental exposure. And that's where the child, the child caregiver comes in. So we have to make sure that these caregivers are uh, qualified and, and understand what they're doing. He's learned the ABCs. He's learned the names we of the We learned streets. so much from the caregivers, especially in the first year of life when the baby started at the center because we didn't know what we were doing. I believe that the caregiver is the ultimate teacher. And what we're learning now is that if you get a caregiver that cares about your baby, the baby can make two or three important relationships. Even though I had her for a short period of time, it was still, you know, she was still special to me. I never want a parent to feel that they're leaving their child with strangers. Martina was almost like a mother to me. It's like losing your mother every time a caregiver goes. It's like saying mommy is gone. I felt sad because I didn't get to say goodbye to her. When the people in the world don't come and go with the speed of summer lightning, then they're able to do the work of young children, which is exploring the world. I used to start crying and say, Mom, don't take me there. And I didn't even know. I told my parents like a few th little things that she did that I didn't like, but I never told them things that I really didn't like. But he's happy now. 
he didn't even want to come home on Friday. <laughs> I wrote a um, letter to the director of our center and it thanked her for one thing and that was showing my son, who was only one year old at the time, that there was a whole array of grown-ups who loved him. We spend almost as much on childcare as we do on our mortgage. 55% of my net pay. How do I pay for childcare? I charge it. I uh, put it on my credit card and I pay it off as I can. We are definitely mortgaging our future because we don't have enough affordable child care. I so strongly feel that corporate America has to open up its eyes and see what working parents are going through. Business care is about child care because it is the number one issue in the minds of our people. Let me answer you by telling you what I see when they're not taken care of. I see parents who are worried, parents who aren't productive at work, parents who have trouble coming to work and frequently have to leave work. So we think it's just absolutely good business. It's not a do-gooder kind of thing. It's a hard-nosed business decision. Well, the investment in, in these types of programs helps you retain quality employees. And if you don't retain them, somebody else is going to get them. Obviously, uh, longer term, we're looking for these children to be employees as well. Every business has to be concerned about the quality of life in its community. And, and I haven't seen an, a, a vital community that doesn't have a quality daycare system. Child care is important to bring communities together. We can say, oh, we'll look after you, make sure you get a job and maybe some uh, health care. But if we forget about the kids, especially those young kids. We're going to lose the minds of these kids before they ever go to kindergarten. So if you want a strong community and a strong school system, you don't start by building up the school system, you start by building up your child care system. The most powerful weapons in our anti-crime arsenal are the programs that help kids. I don't know what percentage children are of our present, but I do know they're 100% of our future. And our job, our nation's job, is to galvanize all the resources that we have in this country and bring them to bear on this problem, this challenge. Well, there needs to be a concern on the part of uh, the communities. There needs to be a concern on the part of companies. There needs to be a concern on the part of private citizens. We are being asked to do something that my father's generation didn't do that his father's generation didn't do. It's just not a question of daycare in the sense of babysitting. You also want quality daycare. You can't go to a budget store for that, you know? You need to get quality input for quality output. We're not talking about providing a Cadillac model for any um, family in America. What we're talking about is just common sense. It'll take a lot of money because taking care of small children isn't cheap, and it shouldn't be. It just seems so very obvious to me. We should all be concerned about child care. It's been really a gift that we've given our children, and it has been the single factor why I've been able to continue in my career. We're people, we're just miniature people, we're mini people. But, I mean, it's not like off on our own when we're born. Somebody has to take care of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Catherine Carliner. My name is Catherine Carliner. When my husband Jesse and I had the first of our two amazing boys three years ago, one issue became central in our lives, and that is the need to find the highest quality care for our children on those days when we can't be with them ourselves. It isn't easy. I spent the better part of my pregnancy and too much of my maternity leave desperately trying to make an informed decision about who would take care of my son. I met with frustration every single step of the way. What I found was a total lack of organized or reliable information and no one to guide me on what was the single most important decision in my life and certainly for the life of my newborn son. We decided we wanted to use a child care center, only to find a lack of options that would meet even our most basic criteria of affordability, proximity to our house, and flexible hours. And in our hearts, that wasn't even the criteria that mattered. What mattered, ultimately, was finding a place where we knew our son would not only be taken care of, but where he would be nurtured, where he would be stimulated, and where he would be loved. 
Happily, we found that and much, much more in a child care center just minutes from our house. It's a place that has become an extension of our home and, like so many people today with no relatives nearby, a very real and a very vital extension of our family. Someone asked me recently how you can leave a four-month-old infant in a child care center. Well, I've done it twice now, so I know that there is only one answer. You can leave your child and you can go to work only when you know that the person who takes him out of your arms every morning will not only take good care of him, but will enrich him, will love him, and will keep him very, very safe from harm. Finding that level of high quality child care today is an overwhelming challenge. And that is why I believe that this conference is such an important first step in raising awareness of this issue and in meeting what I feel is an enormous need, not just for us, but for the millions and millions of working parents who make up this country today. It is, therefore, an incredible honor for me to introduce the person whose sensitivity to the needs of working parents, families, and most of all, our children, has made this conference a reality. The President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the White House. Thank you very much, Kathy Carliner, for your uh, remarkable statement. And I thought you were very good in the film. <laughs> Rob Reiner wants to give you a screen test. Uh, <laughs> I am so happy to see all of you here. Uh, there are many people here who might well be introduced, but I think I must start with the people who are terribly important to whether we will be able to fully achieve our part of the great agenda we are going to lay out today, uh, the members of Congress who are here. And I'd like to call their names, and then when I finish, uh, ask them all to stand. Uh, Senator Herb Cole, who has sponsored legislation on child care, Senator Jack Reed, Congressman Bill Clay, Congressman Sandy Levin, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey, Congresswoman Sue Kelly, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Congressman Javier Becerra, and Congressman Nick Lampson. Would uh, the members of Congress who are here please stand? Thank you for coming. <clears throat> I'd also like to uh, thank my longtime friend Hillary, and I have been friends of uh, Governor Jim Hunt and his wife Carolyn, who are here for almost 20 years now. And I think Governor Romer is here or on his way. Mayor Cleaver, we're glad to see you. And John Sweeney, the head of the FLCIO, and others who've come to be with us today. I thank you very much. This is a happy day at the White House. First, for all the people uh, in the administration and all those who've worked with them for months and months and months to help this day uh, come to pass. And second, and even more important from my point of view, uh, this is a happy day because I have been listening to the First Lady talk about this for more than 25 years now. <laughs> and it may be that I will finally be able to participate in at least a small fraction of what I have been told for a long time I should be doing. And I say that uh, in good humor, but also with great seriousness. This is an anniversary of sorts for me. It was six years ago today, as a newly announced candidate for president, that I went back to my alma mater at Georgetown and began a series of three speeches outlining what I thought America ought to look like in the 21st century and what I thought we would have to do to create a country in which everyone had an opportunity Everyone was expected to be a responsible citizen, and where we came together across all the lines that divide us into one community. There are many things that are 
necessary for that to be done, but clearly two of them are, first, people in this country have to be able to succeed at work and at home in raising their children. And if we put people in the disposition of essentially having to choose one over the other, our country is going to be profoundly weakened. Obviously, if people are worried sick about their children and they fail at work, it's not just individual firms, it's the economic fabric and strength of the country that is weakened. Far more important, if people fail at home, they have failed in our most important job and our most solemn responsibility. Second, we'll never be the kind of country we ought to be unless we believe that every child counts and that every child ought to have a chance to make the most of his or her God-given abilities. That's why we're here today, to examine where we are and what we still have to do. And what we still have to do is quite a lot to make sure we live by what we believe when we say that all parents should be able to succeed at home and at work and that every child counts. No parent should ever have to choose between work and family, between earning a decent wage and caring for a child. Especially in this day and age when most parents work, nothing is more important, as you have just heard Kathy Carliner say, than finding child care that is affordable, accessible, and safe. It is America's next great frontier in strengthening our families and our future. As the Catholic Conference has noted, no government can love a child and no policy can substitute for a family's care. But there is much that we can do to help parents do their duty to their children. From my days as governor of Arkansas to my service as president, strengthening families has been a central goal of what I have worked on. I'm very proud that the first bill I had the opportunity to sign into law as president was the Family and Medical Leave Act. So that no parent has to choose between caring for a child or keeping a job when a family member is ill. The expanded earned income tax credit helps to ensure that parents who work don't have to raise their children in poverty. No one who's out there working full time with children should have to worry about that. Expanded Head Start programs are serving more families than ever before. We've corrected, collected record sums of child support enforcement. The historic balanced budget I signed this summer provides a $500 per child tax credit and helps parents to pay for their children's college education through IRAs, expanded loans and Pell Grants, the Hope Scholarship and other tax credits. The Congress has before it now a program of Secretary Riley's called 21st Century Community Schools in which we ask for funds to help our states keep our schools open after classroom hours for children who have no place else to go and need that environment. We've also made some progress on child care. Since 1993, child care is But we have to do more. With more families required to rely on two incomes to make ends meet, with more single parent families than ever, more young children are left in the care of others, even in their earliest years. And as the First Lady said, we learned at our conference on early childhood and the brain, that's when children develop or fail to develop capacities that will shape the entire rest of their lives. It's also true that more and more school children are returning to empty homes after school. The first thing we have to do is to make it possible for parents to spend time with their children whenever possible. That's why I hope the Congress will vote to expand the family and medical leave law so that parents at least can take some time off for their children's medical appointments, teacher conferences, and other basic duties. And I support flex time laws that will allow workers to choose between receiving overtime and pay or in time off with their families. But during those times when children can't be with their parents, they must get care that keeps them safe and that helps them to learn and grow. As we all know, too often that isn't the case. Too often child care is unaffordable, inaccessible, and sometimes even unsafe. 
The cost, as Hillary said, strains millions of family budgets. And government assistance meets just about a quarter of the need. Even for those who can afford it, sometimes good care is hard to find, as Kathy said in her remarks. Waiting lists sometimes takes months or years to move, forcing many parents to cobble together unstable arrangements. The shortage of care puts older children at risk as well. Five million of them between the ages of five and 14 are left to fend for themselves after school. And as they get older, that increases the chances that they'll be exposed to drugs, tobacco, and crime. Finally, studies have shown that too many childcare facilities are literally unsafe. The tragedies that have befallen families who depended upon childcare continue to make headlines all across our nation. This conference is an important step forward in addressing all these issues. What we learned today should spur us on to find ways to help parents, all parents, afford safe, affordable, high quality childcare, whether it's at home, a childcare center, or a neighbor's house. In the coming months, our administration will develop a plan to be unveiled at the next State of the Union to improve access and affordability and to help to assure the safety of child care in America. In the meantime, I want to announce four specific things we can do right now. First, I'm asking Congress to establish a new scholarship fund for child care providers. Too many caregivers. Too many caregivers don't have the training they need to provide the best possible care. Those who do have training are rarely compensated with higher wages. The scholarship program I propose will help students earn their degrees as long as they remain in the child care field for at least a year, and it will ensure that caregivers who complete their training will receive a bonus or a raise. Second, we have to weed out the people who have no business taking care of our children in the first place. I am transmitting to Congress the National Crime Prevention and Privacy Compact, which will make it e background checks on child care providers easier and more effective by eliminating state barriers to sharing criminal histories for this specific purpose. I urge Congress to pass and states to ratify this legislation. Third, I've asked Secretary Rubin to oversee a working group on child care, composed primarily of business leaders, working with labor and community representatives to find ways more businesses can provide child care or help their employees afford high quality child care. And again, I thank John Sweeney for his important support of this initiative. In some ways, the most gripping part of that film we saw was the father talking about how he was just consumed with worry at work. No parent should ever have to go through that. Finally, we must use community service to strengthen and expand access to after-school programs. Today, the Corporation for National Service, through its To Learn and Grow initiative, will pledge to help after-school programs all across our country to use volunteers to provide better care to children. It is releasing a how-to manual for groups who want to incorporate community service into after-school programs. And I think that, uh, Secretary Riley, if we can win in our little budget battle here on the 21st century community schools, then together we can do some real good out there on this issue. My friends, for centuries, over two now, the American dream has represented a compact that those who work hard and play by the rules should be able to build better lives for themselves and for their children. In this time, and even more into the future, childcare that is too expensive, unsafe, or unavailable will be a very stubborn obstacle to realizing that dream. So let us commit ourselves to clearing the obstacle, to helping parents fulfill their most sacred duty, to keeping the American dream alive for them, and most important, for their children. Thank you very much. excited about uh, the announcements that the President uh, has made and the process that he has uh, outlined leading up to the State of the Union and 
looking forward to working with members of Congress who have a special interest in this issue and have their own ideas for legislation, uh, and I think that uh, we will uh, be able to move forward together. Our first panel uh, is addressing the question, the challenge, availability, affordability, and assuring safety and quality in child care. There are so many issues to be raised, and we have luckily been able to put together people who have various perspectives and expertise on this challenge. The seven members of this panel consist of Ellen Galinsky, the president and co-founder of the Families and Work Institute, Michelle Seligson, the founder and director of the National Institute on Out of School Time, Secretary Bob Rubin, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary Donna Shalala, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Governor James Hunt of North Carolina, Valora Washington, the Program Director of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and Patty Siegel, the Executive Director of the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network. The first question we want to address on this panel is, why is child care important? And we're going to hear from three experts on why child care matters. First, Ellen Galinsky will address why child care is important to our young children and what good care looks like, because we want more parents to know what they're looking for so they can be better informed consumers. Second, we will hear from Michelle Seligson about the importance of after-school opportunities to our nation's youth. And lastly, we will hear from Secretary Rubin about the significance of child care to our economy. So Ellen Galinsky will start off by addressing why child care is important for young children and tell us a little bit about recent research in, neuro, in neuroscience and child development. Ellen? Thank you. On behalf of the so many of us who have worked so long for this day to happen, I really want to thank you for making this day possible. We all know that what we do tomorrow and the next day is so important, but thank you not only for starting the conversation, but for making it, ensuring that it leads to action. Um, last April at the conference that you hosted um, on early learning, this country heard many people for the very first time about the recent research in brain development. We learned that the development of the child's brain following birth is far more rapid and far more extensive than previously believed possible. We also learned that early experience in an elaborate dance between nature and nurture affects the way the child's brain is wired, that the experiences that the young child has, the sound she hears, the sight she sees, the sensations she feels, the things she tastes, all will create synaptic connections affecting the, um, her brain. We also learned that the brain operates on a use it or lose it principle. And finally, we learned, and I think perhaps most importantly for this conference, that the early care that children receive has a decisive and long-lasting effect on their development, um, how they learn, how they control their emotions. Um, scientists have determined two aspects of the relationship that are most important, because it is through relationships that young children experience the world. The two aspects of this relationship that um, are most important are warm care and responsive care. In fact, one researcher from the University of Minnesota has done some very interesting research where she's found that children at the end of a year who have received warm and sensitive care have a much lower level of the stress hormone cortisol. And if they do become stressed, they're able to turn off that reaction much more quickly and more efficiently. So what are the implications of this research on brain development for child care? Let me start by saying that all too often we have talked about the issue of child care is if parents were in one camp and child care in the other. Parent care versus child care. The research on brain development makes it absolutely clear to me, and I hope to everyone else, that we need to shift the conversation. We need to talk about what children need wherever they are cared for, in their own homes, and for the over 60% of children under six in child care, in child care settings as well, as well as older children. So children in child care, what they need 
uh, need what they need in families. They need warm and responsive care. Uh, at the Families and Work Institute, we've done a series of studies about child care um, in association with Carolee Howes from UCLA, Susan Contos from Purdue University, Beth Shin from NYU, and others. Um, in one of the studies we did, we put all of the ways that we looked at quality into one analysis to try to see which aspects of children's experience most affected um, their healthy development uh, and their school readiness. And we found that what was most important was warm care and responsive care. Uh, several other studies uh, have found the same thing. Now, of course, families are first and foremost in children's lives, but children need warm and responsive care both in, at home and in child care. Uh, we've done a number of studies that have asked parents what's most important to them when they look for child care. And interestingly enough, they say the same things. They want their children to be safe, of course, that's first. But then they want someone who pays attention to their child, that's responsive care. They want someone who loves their, chi their child, as Kathy said, um, that's warm care. And they want caregivers who tell them what's going on with their child during the day when they're not there so that they don't feel that they have to miss this part of their child's life. Well, so what does warm and responsive care mean? Now, a lot of people, and I've heard this recently in the, in the media discussions uh, leading up to this conference, so many people think that, well, when you talk about quality or you talk about warm and uh, responsive care, it's a soft, fuzzy concept, and you know, how can you measure it? How can you really know what it is? That's not true at all. We can measure it. We can measure it in very reliable ways in our research. Um, warm care means caring about the child. It means expressing joy in who the child is, and helping that child feel safe and secure. Responsive care is a very complex measure uh, and a, con uh, a complex uh, concept um, because it encompasses all aspects of kids' development. Emotionally, it may mean comforting a child who's hurt. Socially, it may mean teaching toddlers who bump each other on the head when they both want the same truck that there are other ways to negotiate. Um, in child care, which is often children's first group experience, they learn very important social skills um, that stand them in good stead for the rest of their lives. One child that I know said it best when he was looking back at his child care experience. He said, I learned when I was three that if I made a mistake in my painting, that I could cover it over with white paint. That was much better than falling on the floor and having a temper tantrum. Intellectually, responsive care means responding to the baby who points to the ball by using words, do you want the ball, even before the child talks, because we've learned from the brain development research that children are learning about language before they say their first words. It means um, when the preschooler gets all excited about trucks, it means for the, pro the provider goes out and gets a, gets a book about trucks or writes down the child's words about trucks or tell, has the child tell other people about trucks, seeing that those little squiggles on the page are in fact words and it's the beginning of reading and, and so forth. Uh, because it is really very important to know that these early experiences are in fact education before school. They are the foundations of school readiness and school success and self-confidence. All of these characteristics are laid down in these early years. So how do families know what good care is? Uh, if they want to know about warm care, they can just look at what happens between providers or child. If they're uh, not with, a, with a, um, a group, they can see whether the provider talks to them as opposed to their child, if be, being t paying attention to their child. You can also ask uh, a, um, a provider to describe a child that she has taken care of. And if she uses negative words, chances are she'll use negative words about your child too. That's a good clue. Don't use that provider. Um, you can tell if the provider is responsive. Probably the best and quickest way is to, if you walk into a, a, an early childhood program and all the kids rush up to you, uh, they're not busy. They're not involved. You want to, when you walk in, for the kids to barely look up and to, um, to be so involved in what they're doing that the sounds are pleasant in the room. Now, which providers are most likely to provide good care, good, warm, and responsive care? Um, the name on the door does not at all symbolize whether or not it's good care. It's the person. It's the person. It's not whether it's Head Start or pre-K or, or a child care in a home or in your own home or in a center. It's the person who's most important. Um, and studies have found the characteristics that are most likely to be linked with warm and responsive care. It's having enough adults for each child, smaller group child, so that the kids can get individual attention. Child care providers who continue to learn um, about children and their development. And low staff turnover, which of course is affected by how much staff are paid. 
so that the children can form stable relationships, so that they don't have to, like that child that we saw in the video, feel so sad when the provider left without saying goodbye. And I was there when we taped that child, and that, that child's provider uh, got a better job to make more money, um, and that's why uh, she left. Care that takes, home, uh, takes place in homes, we've also identified the characteristics that are most important there. First, it's that people want to be taking care of children, and that may sound obvious, but in fact, there are a lot of people who take care of children who don't really want to, and uh, so we shouldn't make assumptions about uh, even relatives um, that uh, it's important for people to want to be providing this care. People who seek out opportunities to learn, who have training, also do a better job. They think ahead about what the children are going to do, and they seek out the companies of other people who are providing care. We call this intentional care because the people are intentional about it. They're learning. Just as in, as in corporate America, we've learned that the best companies are the learning organizations. The best child care providers are the learning people. Now, what have studies found out about the quality of care in this country? And that's the, uh, the bad news part of this. We found that about 12 to 14 percent of kids are in care that really enhances their growth and development. That between 12 and 21 percent are in arrangements that could be considered actually dangerous to their growth and development. And that the majority of kids are safe, but they're not really learning. So what does this look like? People always ask in our research, what does it look like? Well, in an un unsafe setting, you see dangerous objects lying around, tiles falling out of the roof. Um, you see a provider who's asleep, not really watching the kids. You see kids in play pens all day long in the back room. Um, really, you know, it could break your heart. Too many children crowded together. What does mediocre care look like? Well, in our research, we call it running from the front of the couch to the back of the couch. Kids don't have anything to do. They're safe, but they're not really learning anything. They're wandering aimlessly, another word we use in our research. Can quality be improved? Yes, it can be improved. We've done a series of studies at the Families and Work Institute that show that it doesn't even take a whole lot to improve the quality. We did one study of 18 to 36 hours of training in family child care, and we found that the relationships between the provider and the child were improved. The children were much more involved in activities. Um, and the environment had improved. We did another study in a state that had improved its uh, regulations, that had improved the number of adults for each child or the ratios, and it had improved the, uh, the educational credentials that teachers were required to have. And the results were pretty phenomenal, 75% fewer disciplinary problems. Um, you know, the quality shot way up so that um, about two-fifths of the kids were in good quality care as opposed to the usual 12 to 14%. Language development improved. So, um, and it didn't, interestingly enough, this change, people always say you can't do this because it'll just, you know, um, make care unaffordable, it'll make people stop providing care and so forth. It didn't happen in this state. Care still remained affordable from the perspective of the parents and, and the child care providers. New insight into brain development of young children reveals that we know what it takes to promote the healthy development of young children. Uh, it is my fervent hope that this historic conference will shift the debate about whether mothers should work and whether children should be in child care. Let's support families in whatever choices they make. We know how to make workplaces more responsive to the needs of families in ways that enhance productivity, and we know how to improve the quality of early education and care in ways that benefit children. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Ellen, I think that um, your work over the last number of years from the Families and uh, Work Institute has really helped to highlight a lot of these issues. And one of the most important audiences for this conference, of course, are parents. And I'd like to ask you how we do a better job of, uh, you know, empowering parents to make choices about working and child care that are best for their families. And as a subsidiary of that, in particular, uh, what are your views about how we can support parents who want to stay home with their children? Well, we, we have the notion in this country that there is a system of choice. But in fact, if you look at parents choosing child care, we find in our studies between um, 58 and, and 75 percent of parents feel that they have zero other choices other than the arrangement that they've chosen when they have child care. So of course we need to provide better quality child care. And we need to provide the choice for families to stay at home that's a real choice. And you talked about uh, the earned income tax credit, and you talked, to, talked about family medical leave. Um, so you know, it's, it's income and it's programs and policies that support them. But I think even more important is respect. 
Uh, right now, I feel often when I talk to mothers and fathers around the country that those mothers who work feel that they're, that they're doing something wrong, that they're missing out on their child's life, that society is judging them negatively. And the mothers who are staying at home feel that they're losing the opportunity to earn money and that their society is judging them negatively. So I think what we need to do is to, you know, I, I keep wondering, what are we doing to this generation of families? You know, let's, let's really not only provide real choices, but let's respect them in the choices that they make. Thank you. Well, I'd like to ask a, one question. First of all, I can't help saying this. When, when I heard you say that warm and responsive childcare actually triggered a biochemical reaction that reduced stress, I, I wish we could have a center like that for the White House staff and the <laughs> Congress. <laughs> And, uh, and for working may, parents at our yeah, we, we may actually uh, come up with a revolutionary new proposal here today. <laughs> let, let me ask you a serious question. W one of the things that I have, um, that I constantly try to deal with here, uh, that I'm super sensitive to because I was a governor for 12 years before I came here, is trying to determine who should do what. What we can do and make a difference, what we have to basically either exhort or incentivize or require some other people to do. I was quite uh, taken by the comment you made that only 36 hours of training of a child care worker can make a huge difference. I can't help thinking there probably are a lot of young, often single parents that might benefit from the same 36 hours of training. And I'm wondering what, how you think uh, that issue ought to be dealt with. I mean. Should, uh, should, should states basically upgrade their training standards and put funds into it? Should there be um, training centers established to more than are there now, even if everybody were required to do it? Are, are there enough places that do the training in, in all states? Talk a little bit about how we might set up an infrastructure and pattern of training to give, uh, let's suppose we had, we said within two years we wanted every childcare uh, provider, even people who do it out of their homes wherever to get the 36 hours of training. And we'd like it to be open, let's say, to low-income parents who, uh, when, who are having their first child. How would we do such a thing? The, um, the, uh, uh, the block grant in child care actually, I think, was very helpful. The, the, some of the programs that we looked at were, were uh, supported by that. And what they did was to let communities determine how best to meet the needs of the, the people there. But what was particularly interesting to, to me in that, so you need to make training available. You need to also um, make it, uh, and I think your proposal is terribly important, you need to make sure that people who get training then uh, make enough money to be able to stay in the field. Um, people came into the training in our study um, for not, not so much to learn about kids, but they came in to training to figure out what do I do Monday morning, how do I deal with business practices, um, sort of the, the more practical aspects of, of um, how do I manage my job. And then they got interested in kids and their development. And when that 18 to 36 hours of training was over, almost everyone, more than 95 percent, wanted uh, to continue their training, and they wanted it tied into a credentialing system. They wanted to get college credit for it. Um, and, and then we followed them over the next year or so, and uh, about half of them did get more training. So it's not just the, that 36 hours is a magic number or that there's a magic bullet. It's the opportunity to provide meaningful training, training that really helps people where they are in their own development, and then and to have it continue. But what percentage of the people who are now providing child care get that kind of training? That's the question I'm trying to get. <laughs> well, I don't really know the exact figure of that, but I don't think that it's uh, very many. I mean, in most states in the country, um, all you have to do to start being a child care provider is be alive and breathing and over 18 years old and, and uh, hopefully be a good person, as you're saying. And then you have to promise in many states to get training in a study that we have just finished that hasn't been released yet, even though they required 30 hours of training in that state, very few people actually did it and it was required. So it's not enough to require it. We need to have a system that supports it. In that particular study, 
Um, the, there were obstacles to getting the training. It uh, wasn't a bit, you know, so easily accessible, and they couldn't have time off to do it. So we need to create training that is um, available, affordable, nearby, and good quality. And we need to have the whole child care system supported. You have a requirement, and then you don't enforce it. You know, you might as well not have it. You know, that just reminds me of how often I've heard it said that, you know, we have all kinds of licensing and uh, professional requirements for people who uh, do your hair or uh, other kinds of important uh, functions. Uh, why did I think of hair first? I don't know. Um, <laughs> can't imagine. Um, but that we don't have anything like the same licensing, um, credentialing uh, requirements for people who hold themselves out as childcare workers. So there's a, a real disconnect between what we say is important and what we value and what we have systems for uh, supporting. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I'd like to move on now to Michelle Seligson, who uh, will raise another uh, aspect of this uh, issue, and that's the importance of programs for school-age children for their development, uh, school readiness, and safety. Uh, we now have, I think it's fair to say, the largest number of youngsters in school than we've ever had in the United States. Isn't that right, uh, Secretary Riley? I think we have a new baby boom or a boomlet. Uh, and a lot of those um, students don't have uh, safe places to go to after school. Uh, so this is an increasing problem seen by law enforcement and other community officials. And I'd like to ask Michelle Seligson to d address that. Thank you. Uh, President and Mrs. Clinton, thank you very, very much for inviting me and giving me the honor of participating in this conference. It's very exciting, tremendously exciting to know that you're interested in this vital issue and that you want to help. I first got involved in school-age child care more than 25 years ago when I needed after-school care for my own children, Sally and Jonathan. I was lucky to connect with other parents, and we started a parent co-op center with a small after-school program. My experience starting a program going on to help others in my town begin school-age programs based in schools and hearing from schools and families around the country about their concerns led me to establish the School-Age Child Care Project. We're now calling ourselves the National Institute on Out-of-School Time because we want to expand definitions of care to include older children because no self-respecting middle school kid wants to be thought of as being in childcare. <laughs> Where do children go after school? Is it a problem? What do they do? Many adults over the age of 30 remember out of school time as time to play with friends, explore the neighborhood, play records, ride bikes, and above all, eat. Someone's mother or relative was home, but mostly kids entertained themselves. This isn't true of everyone, but it seems to be true when we do workshops with people and we ask them to sort of think back in their memory about what it was like to be a kid. Most people remember feeling safe. Things are different now. Kids don't speak about feeling safe in their neighborhoods or even at home. 25 million children in America have working parents, many of whom work full time once their kids reach school. Risks to health and even life are now common among young children. According to the National Center on Juvenile Justice, newly reported data from eight states on peak hours for violent juvenile crime show nearly half of crimes taking place between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. after school. A 1990 University of California study and other studies found unsupervised children are at significantly higher risks for truancy, stress, receiving poor grades, risk-taking behavior, and substance abuse. And children spend more of their out-of-school time watching television than any other single activity. And we know the impact of that on kids. They read less, they play less, and some studies find that they are more aggressive. On average, American children spend 40 hours a week watching Typical television, week, and often all summer and during school vacations and holidays. What does research say about what makes for healthy kids who feel good about themselves and others and who are competent in school? The key studies point to two factors, caring relationships and constructive activities. 
One evaluation of after-school programs conducted by Deborah Vandell at the University of Wisconsin finds that the single most important factor is the quality of children's interactions with the program staff. And that's that warm and responsive theme again. Kids do better in school. They're more self-assured if they attend carefully planned but flexible programs where the primary work of the adults is caring about and for the kids. Jerome Bruner has written compellingly that what helps kids learn is the nature of their relationships, our capacity to listen to them and to hear their stories. We develop a sense of self, not in a vacuum, but in relation to others. Informal learning environments offer an opportunity to build good social relationships with other children and the chance to try to learn something you don't know how to do in a safe place, physical or act artistic or intellectual, in a safe place where you don't pass or fail. Good after-school programs make that possible, as do appropriate ratios of adult staff who understand the age group, who are comfortable in a relaxed setting that is different from the regular school day and who use their unique talents and personalities and their capacity to engage the children. Good after-school programs respect the power of play as children's work and the unique characteristics of an individual child. These are the fundamentals of quality. How are communities dealing with this issue today? Schools, churches, parks and recreation centers, youth serving agencies, child care centers, family daycare homes, every community institution, including libraries and public housing and corporate headquarters, are potential sites and potential partners in this enterprise. Some states have enacted enabling legislation so schools can partner with community agencies, and others have financed training and new program development. There has been generous funding from the corporate sector the American Business Collaboration has helped to develop more programs and improve quality in communities in which they have employees and also for the rest of the community. There are national service members this very day helping out staff in school age programs across the nation. And a privately funded initiative of the DeWitt Wallace Reader's Digest Fund called MOST, which stands for Making the Most of Out of School Time, focuses on cities as a logical locus for building and improving the supply of school age care. In Chicago, a new partnership with the city's park district is creating new school age child care spaces for several thousand children. In Boston, Parents United for Child Care has leveraged hundreds of thousands of dollars from the private and public sectors to support low income families school age child care. And in Seattle, Anyone can go to a public library or 88 other community access points to log on free to the database and get information about 300 out-of-school time programs like art centers, sports and recreation, and tutorial services. But there are some big problems. This is not just about some working families needing after-school child care. This is an issue that cuts across all income groups, including families preparing to enter the out-of-home workforce. Every family that is on this very day managing the work and family and school and childcare whirlwind knows exactly what I mean. Yet some Americans are more in need of help with school-age childcare than others. Some don't have the resources to pay for lessons, after-school sports, academic programs, summer camps. Some kids, therefore, don't get the same exposure to ideas and skills and positive relationships with adults and their peers. The National Before and After School Program study clearly shows this discrepancy. 83% of approximately 50,000 before and after school programs depend almost entirely on parent fees for their survival. Many families simply can't pay that. And we also know very little, if, if anything, about how immigrant and refugee families manage their children's out-of-school time. While there is widespread agreement on standards of quality and a new national accreditation system, quality is uneven at best. It's more and more difficult to retain qualified school-age childcare staff. 
salaries are low, turnover is high, and people move on quickly to better paying work. Programs often pass along to parents the cost of having to lease school facilities and pay for custodial services. There is a huge transportation problem. Who should pay to bus children to after-school programs in the community? Should the parents pay? Should the school district pay? Some school boards have welcomed partnerships with community-based organizations or are running their own programs in the schools, but others resist them and resist having anything to do with what is known as childcare. Many families have even more trouble than others finding good care. Families whose children have special needs, rural families, parents with middle school children, an underserved group that has some of the most pressing needs. We know what to do to solve some of these problems. There are three ways national leadership could help. First, following up on this conference, please keep the spotlight on this issue both inside and outside government. Second, finance more school-age care for low and moderate income parents regardless of their relationship to welfare. Good school-age care benefits society. The investment will pay off in terms of producing long-term results in children and especially as a prevention strategy. And finally, fund those community-level strategies that enable groups to work across institutions to collaborate on discovering and meeting local needs and expanding services to meet those needs. An official incentive encourages people to cross institutional lines, and funding is an additional incentive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to make a couple of observations. I thought what you said was terrific. First of all, you know, un until the, the crime rate in America has been going down for five years now, rather steeply, but it's been going up among people under 18. It may have leveled off, maybe dropping a little bit now. We're hopeful, but it's, if it is, it's because more and more communities are doing what you suggested. We need another, at least another year to see whether it's changed. But it's, uh, you are very familiar with what's been done in Boston, and one of the things that's been done is the whole sort of juvenile justice system has been geared to be warm and responsive. I mean, where uh, juvenile probation officers make house calls with police officers. And community groups walk the streets in the afternoon to basically almost pick the kids up and give them things to do and get them involved with things. And as far as I know, it's the only major city in America where nobody under 18 has been killed by a gun in two years now. But it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's a, a systematic attempt to take personal responsibility for all these children after school. And I can tell you, if you, you see the flip side of it in these juvenile crime rates, it's really touching uh, to, and quite moving. The other thing I wanted to say is, uh, I wondered if you had any sense, just as a practical matter, of whether these programs tend to work better if they are school-based. And the reason I ask that is, I think that we fight these battles around here all the time, you know, of how to spend the school money and most money for schools comes from the state and local level anyway. But I think one of the biggest problems that these schools have on the issue you've talked about is that in school after school after school after school, financial problems have caused them to cut back on their art programs, cut back on their music programs, cut back on their non-varsity athletic programs. The things that children used to typically do after school or could stay in after school and do, they, the, the, these school districts, as they're now budgeting, and as they're now staffed and under the rules that, under which they now labor, they cannot, more and more schools are dropping these programs. And I think it's disastrous because it, a lot of it is just exactly how children relate in a kind of a non-linear, non-just purely intellectual way that both of you have said is so important. Yes. And I was wondering if, you, if you've seen that and if you think that's contributing to the problem. I mean, a lot of people without any programs used to just stay after school because there was an art project, there was a music project, you were getting ready for a concert. The, the, uh, the, uh, the intramural teams were playing. And this is, uh, you know, there are sc huge school districts in this country where all these things are a thing of the past. People look at you like you've lost your mind when you talk about this now. They haven't had these things in years. And it may be that one of the things we ought to be exploring is whether we can 
reinstitute some of these things in the lives of our schools that would naturally lead to an out of school atmosphere so they wouldn't think about adopting a new program approach. Anyway, I just kind of wanted to ask you that. Are the schools the best place if they work or, or does it not matter if you do it right? I, I think it should be a matter of whoever is ready, willing, and able to do after school programs. And I think if schools are ready, willing, and able to do them and to find the resources to make them enriching and creative environments, then schools should be the place. But it's not an either-or situation because really schools can partner with community-based organizations. And most of the school-based care that's, that's out there right now looks like that. It looks like partnerships with the Y or with uh, community organizations. And then there are some school districts that have put money behind after-school care because they see it in their best interests to do that in terms of what the outcomes will be for the kids. And some Title I money is going into after-school programs. So I think all of it is possible. Uh, I don't see the schools as the only locus. And there are, because there is so, such lo local autonomy about decision making, the local school board makes those decisions, um, it's very much a community by community decision. Can you speak more though about what makes up a good after school program? What are the components that you would look for? Um, as a parent or as a community leader who <laughs> wanted to provide such a service uh, in your community. Uh, because sometimes I worry that, uh, just as um, the President was saying, a lot of what we took for granted when we were growing up is no longer readily available. And a lot of the after school programs that I visit or that I hear about seem so academically oriented. They're not letting kids sort of blow off steam and uh, explore other talents and be part of doing something different. Uh, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about what the components of a good after-school program are and address the issue about whether or not they're valuable only if they are academically oriented. Well, of course, the single most important feature in an after-school program that one would call good is the staff. And that means people who have been trained, who are prepared to work in these informal learning environments with kids. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say about the academic programs is that academic programs are fine as, as long as they understand, those program planners understand, that you can't do academics alone in, in a vacuum without meeting the other needs of kids. Because kids will vote with their feet. And even if they uh, stay in the program, they may be absent emotionally or mentally. So all programs should have good space, comfortable facilities. Children should feel that they're not just occupying a cafeteria that um, isn't really theirs, where they can put their things down, where they can start a project and not have to wrap it up before they're finished with it, where someone actually looks at them and says, aha, so you're interested in radio or chess or macrame or whatever, and really takes the time to create opportunities for that child to learn how to do those things and, and do them well. So I think it's about, as I said, the relationship um, and the individual, the nature of the relationship between the staff and the individual child. And, and I think also for parents, it has to be a place where they feel comfortable coming. Many parents find after-school programs to be sort of gateways for them into the school, sort of mediating uh, places, a, a way to feel more comfortable themselves with the actual school teachers and the regular school day. Thank you very much, Thank Michelle. You. Now we're um, going to move to our warm and responsive Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> why, why do people laugh at that? I don't understand. <laughs> I, I, I meant it as being descriptive. Uh, yeah, but it wasn't received that way. <laughs> Uh, I think it's very important, uh, as we saw in the video and as all of you who've been involved in this uh, issue for a long time know, uh, to address the significance of child care to our nation's economy. Uh, and certainly there isn't anyone better than uh, Secretary Rubin to talk about uh, the economic perspectives that we should bring in our consideration of these issues, uh, and I would like to invite him to do so now. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clinton. Uh, well, it, it, 
I think concern some of Treasury as well, that a, a sector of the Treasury may have developed a heart when they heard that I was going to be here. But I very quickly reassured them. <laughs> uh, my focus and my job is on the economy. And in my view, child care is exceedingly important with respect to the health of our economy. Over the past five years, you know, I related to the fellow in the film who said he didn't believe in do-gooderism, he just wanted to worry about his bottom line. That was the world that I, I came out of. <laughs> Over the past five years, uh, as you know, our economy has had exceedingly strong economic conditions. We've had low unemployment, we've had low inflation, we've had a very high rate of job creation, and we've had rising standards of living. In addition, the deficit uh, has been brought down almost uh, to nothing, and we're on a track now toward a a balanced budget. And many factors have contributed to this, but in, in my judgment, there is no question but that the key and the indispensable factor was the sound economic program the President put in place beginning in 1993 that was grounded in fiscal responsibility, investing in our people through education, training, health care, and the like, and opening markets around the world. The great concern that I have now is that this prosperity may mask the challenges that we face and lull us into complacency, and that we must not do. Instead, we must face the problems and the issues that need to be effectively addressed if we're going to be successful and prosperous in the global economy over the long run. A key question is how do we continue creating an environment that promotes increased productivity, which in turn is critical to competitiveness in the new global economy and to raising standards of living in this country. And creating that environment clearly includes many elements. But there is no doubt that a critical key to increased productivity is to have a flexible and mobile workforce in which everyone can participate to the full extent of his or her abilities. And that is where child care, in my judgment, is central. Before joining the Clinton administration in 1993, I worked in the private sector for 26 years. I can remember when I first began there, there were virtually no women in executive or managerial positions, in large measure, I think, because there were virtually no women in the business or professional schools from which organizations drew. Over time, that has changed enormously and is continuing to change. The talented women have joined executive, managerial, and professional ranks in increasing numbers. Businesses then faced the challenge of keeping very good people as they started their own families. In my own experience in what was admittedly a small and specialized segment of the private sector, left me with the very strong view that it is enormously in the interest of business to create a work environment that supports the needs of each individual through measures such as flex time, telecommuti telecommuting, and of course, by providing access to childcare. All of this benefits the individual, and that's obvious, but it also benefits the company by allowing it to draw from the largest possible universe of individuals as its potential employees, and by best enabling it to retain its talented and knowledgeable people. Moreover, the economy at large benefits, because by better enabling each individual to fulfill his or, own, his or her own potential, Child care better enables the entire economy to fulfill its full potential. Just as the composition of businesses and professional firms changed, the composition of the labor force overall has changed substantially. Today, 62% of married mothers with a child under six work, compared with 30% in 1970. This change has meant a whole new set of issues facing working parents. Today, there are 20 million families with either a working single parent or two working parents using child care, including 8 million families with children under the age of five. The majority of these families are middle income, but even for these families, cost, quality, and availability of child care are issues of major concern. Moreover, the challenge of finding affordable child care is particularly difficult for lower income people especially for those people who are trying to work, move from welfare to work. 
For a working family with an annual income of $14,000, preschool childcare will cost an average of roughly 25% of their annual income. And in many states, a single parent leaving welfare to enter the workforce after you take into account losing government benefits and the cost of childcare will see his or her income increase by less than 50, 50 cents for each additional dollar earned. Whether we speak of low or middle income families, I don't think there is any doubt that providing effective childcare is an issue of critical importance not only to the families, though that's obvious, but also to our society, to business, and to our economy. And I believe all of us have important roles to play, families, businesses, and government at all levels, federal, state, and local. One way to address this challenge is through public-private partnerships. In Rochester, New York, for example, a public-private partnership established in 1990 the Rochester Monroe County Early Childhood Development Initiative developed a set of goals for improving child care, worked with business to provide private funds for accredited child care, and worked with United Way to subsidize child care for low-income families. During its first five years, these efforts led to the creation of child care for 2,000 additional families, and 86 percent of Rochester's three- and four-year-olds are now in child care, up from less than 35 percent in 1989. There are also many businesses that have run their own programs, and there are many businessmen and women who are very intensely focused on this problem, including Sandy Weil, who I notice is here with us today. Lancaster Laboratories, a company with 600 employees in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, opened an on-site child care center in 1986. The center offers care for 150 children with full-time care for preschoolers from six weeks and an after-school program up to age 11. Ninety-four percent of mothers on maternity leave now return to work, compared to one-half before the center opened. As a consequence, the company doesn't have to retrain and doesn't have to hire and train new workers to replace workers who don't come back to their firms. And as a consequence of that, the benefits to the company exceed the cost of operating the child care center. Most small businesses encounter significant barriers with respect to running their own programs. And this is an area I think that we need to look at and we need to find solutions to those problems. By identifying and publicizing programs such as those that I've just described, we can spread that kind of success elsewhere. I'm very pleased to take the lead that the program that the President announced in his remarks, by calling together a private sector working group to explore the problems of child care for working parents and to identify and publicize best practices that deserve greater attention. Addressing these issues can contribute not only to the lives of working parents and children, but also to business profitability and to the well-being of our economy in the new global economy where it is imperative that every American be enabled to work up to his or her potential so that we can be productive and competitive and successful. Thank you very much. I have to excuse Secretary Rubin in a moment. Uh, to return to his duties, but I, I wanted to make a, one point and ask one question. The point I want to make is uh, he tries real hard to put on that sort of cold shtick, you know, that this is just economics, but I am uh, I learned that from him, that word, you know, but uh, I, I'm sure you could see there was more there. It occurred to me listening to you talk about this that this is an, this child care issue is an example of what makes our work both wonderful and maddening. How many, how many times have uh, Secretary Roddy and I said that every problem in American education has been solved by somebody in some school somewhere? So why can't, why don't we get uniform excellence? 
I just had a very, uh, the most difficult policy development process I have been through, I think since I've been president, that uh, Secretary Rubin and I did together. It was on the, trying to develop America's position on climate change. But it had very little to do with the science. Everybody, there is literally enough technology out there today to enable us, without lowering our standard of living, indeed while raising our standard of living, to substantially cut our emissions of greenhouse gases. And you can, I can cite you industry after industry after industry that's made a ton of money doing it on their own. So why doesn't everybody do it? Why don't we even have a critical mass of companies doing it? And I ask you that question. So we got another example here with child care. If you can cite these examples where all these companies are making money and having happy, more productive employees, what are the barriers? What is, why is the market dysfunctional in cases like this? And what can we do to make it work? Because if we were trying to get hookups to the internet, we'd have 100% penetration and one-tenth of the time it takes us to get 10% penetration for educational excellence, environmental conservation, or spread of child care. What's the difference? You asked me? I think it is, I think it's the most single, most important <laughs> question about social policy today. I mean, you know, I mean, you and I think about this all the time, but I don't know what you think about this. Just, <laughs> this is not in the notes, you know, he's not prepared to say this. You're President of the United States, you're supposed to know the answers to these things, but, <laughs> but having said that, I'll give you a view of whatever it's worth. I, I think, Mr. President, you make a very good point, and I think you can point to a lot of other areas where the same, where the same thing is true. I think what, what we need to do, and it's true with respect to the importance of our, of, of our country and the global economy, the importance of, of, of trade liberalization and a lot of other things, I think there is a, a need for a massive effort of trying to improve the understanding of, of people in all parts of our economy and our society about what we really need to do in this new and modern global economy. And I, I think one of the great difficulties is trying to communicate what really matters, <laughs> issues such as this, in a world where there's so much else coming in at people that really, in my judgment, matters very little. But I think that your point here, which is to set up a private sector group of some sort, or it wouldn't be totally private sector necessarily, but a group of people of some sort, to try to identify best practices, try to identify what works, try to identify problems, and then go out and amongst their peers try to, to bring to their peers the same understanding that they've acquired through their own experience is maybe the most effective and best way to try to do this rather than having somebody else who's not part of their world talking to them and trying to bring them in, into a, a shared understanding. And that's at least what we're going to try to do with this, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Rubin. And um, it is true, I think you could hear the frustration in the President's voice that uh, he spends a lot of time and uh, all of us around him spend a lot of time wondering why uh, the best practices and the model programs in a variety of areas uh, in our country don't receive greater uh, awareness and provide um, more models for people to follow uh, so that we could uh, spread the success that uh, is evident in uh, so many ways every time you travel around our country. Uh, and we're going to turn to the next part of our program and in a, in a way start addressing uh, this very issue. Uh, because part two is how we are doing in meeting the challenge and what we need to be doing. Uh, we're going to turn to uh, four additional experts who will address how we're working to assure that families have access to safe, affordable child care. Uh, and also give us some insight into what is working well and what we might do to try to replicate that. Uh, Secretary Shalala will provide an overview of uh, what is happening in child care around the nation. Uh, Governor Hunt will address the issue from a state perspective and particularly share with us his experience uh, over his years as governor in reshaping the child care uh, system in the state of North Carolina. And Valora Washington will tell us about what communities are doing. And Patty Siegel uh, will bring us uh, messages from the front lines where the rubber meets the road and people are actually uh, taking care of children and parents are making these difficult decisions. Uh, so Secretary Shalala, would you please start uh, and by giving us an assessment and overview of how we're doing uh, as a nation? 
Thank you very much, Mrs. Clinton, Mr. President. Um, before I start, I do want to acknowledge uh, three other cabinet secretaries that are here, the Secretary of Labor, Alexis Herman, the Secretary of Education, Dick Riley, Secretary of uh, Transportation, uh, Rodney Slater, and the Deputy Secretary of Defense and the head of the GSA are also here. We're all partners in this administration in developing the President's initiatives related to children, early childhood, and, and um, it's a very good partnership. When I'm talking to parents uh, who are struggling to make ends meet, when I'm talking to single mothers, there are always two words that come out, child care. Um, parents actually usually talk in whispers. Most would rather tell their bosses that they had a flat tire than they had a child care problem. Um, Mr. President, Mrs. Clinton, there are more child care problems in America than flat tires. Uh, <laughs> And I want to thank you for bringing the issue of child care into the spotlight. It has to be a partner with the states and the communities and labor and business and religious leaders and community organizations and families to meet this country's growing child care needs. But why? Because, as Secretary Rubin said, investing in child care and in after-school programs is one of the best investments we can make for this country's economic future. Mr. President, I have to admit it, I'm a Clevelander and an Indians fan. And I've been watching the World Series. And when I think about where we stand in understanding and addressing the child care issues that are facing this country, I see us in a seventh inning stretch. We know that we're doing better, but not as well as we should. We know that the picture of child care is very uneven in this country. That's what's been reported to us already. Some communities are doing very well, and others are not stepping up to the plate. And knowing that the most important part of the game is yet to come, because of your leadership, Mr. President, and the First Lady, the early innings have brought us some genuine progress. As you've pointed out, we're spending more. This year, we've invested $3 billion in the Child Care Development Block Grant, an increase of almost 70% since 1993. Combined with state funds, we're helping to care for one million children from welfare families and from the working poor. And since you took office, our investment in Head Start has almost doubled to $4 billion, which the Head Start program, an extraordinary program, now serves 800,000 children each year. Our dependent care tax credit, valued at $2.5 billion, will help 5 million families pay for child care this year. We're also learning more. There was a reference to Deborah Vandell's work. The National Institute of Child Health and Human Development has found a direct link in the, from their researches between high quality child care and a child's subsequent, subsequent cognitive and language development. We're reaching out more. We started a national child care information center to share information with states and communities. We're fostering public private partnerships. We're providing states with technical assistance and models that work to help them address quality and other important issues, and taking models and role models like Governor Jim Hunt to other states. We're linking child care and health care agencies to improve safety and to give children the health care services that they need. But as the President and the First Lady made very clear this morning, we have to do more and we have to do better. Today, only one million children receive federal child care assistance even though 10 million are eligible. And because the seventh inning stretch is a time not only to stand up but also to look out and to engage in a real national dialogue about where we are and what each of us must do, uh, let me give you a snapshot of where we think the gaps are on three issues, availability, affordability, and quality. For parents, they think about child care as can I get it, can I afford it, and can I trust it? First, can I get child care? We don't have a big centralized child care system in this country. We have a very diverse, very decentralized system that includes everything from company-sponsored daycare centers to family daycare to informal arrangements with friends and relatives. And yet too many parents don't have access to even one of these options. As the GAO made clear this year, parents are running up against major shortages of care, particularly if they have infants, if they have a child with a disability, if they have a school-age child, and for families working non-traditional hours. It's a particular problem, as Michelle said, if you have a teenager. 
Over half of our schools do not offer after-school services to children, and these same children, particularly in low-income communities, often cannot find after-school care in their neighborhoods either. I love the discussion about after-school care and the kind of skill it takes, particularly for teenagers, to find good care. Mr. President, I can assure you, I have not been able to sit still after 3 o'clock since I started kindergarten. <laughs> And most American children cannot be expected to sit still after 3 o'clock. But even when child care is available, it's often inaccessible because there's no transportation from home to work or to the place of care. But assume that parents can find and get child care, it still has to be affordable or it doesn't do them much good. Which brings me to the second point, can I afford it? As Mrs. Clinton has pointed out, families are learning, earning less than $1,200 than $1, a month pay about a quarter of their income for child care. The federal government is trying to ease this burden. We've done a pretty good job of helping people move from welfare to work by expanding child care. Most federal assistance goes to families at or near the poverty line. For a family of four, that's an income of just over $16,000. But this problem extends far beyond poor families. It's a challenge that faces every working family. It's great that many states are trying to make child care more affordable by linking eligibility to income instead of welfare status. But we need to be careful, because even as many states increase eligibility, they're also thinking about increasing the amount that they expect parents to pay. And even when parents can get and afford child care, they still have to ask the question, can I trust it? And that's the third and the last piece of the child care problem, quality and safety. No matter where you live or what kind of care you choose, parents should always have the confidence that their children are getting the best. We have many extraordinary child care settings that we should be very proud of. They're in the military, they're in business, they're in schools, they're in homes, they're in churches, they're in synagogues, and they're all over our communities. Yet many child care arrangements have very serious shortcomings. Part of the problem is the low reimbursement rates from many states. And another part is inadequate licensing. <laughs> All states have some form of child care licensing, but many children, even infants, are in care that is exempted from the child care licensing in the states. To make matters worse, when our department found, went out, we found numerous instances where child care facilities did not comply with the state's health and safety standards. And unlike the military, where child care centers are regularly inspected without announcements many times each year, in the civilian sector, too many children uh, in child care programs don't receive even a single inspection every year. Perhaps the biggest threat to quality is poor training and low wages for child care workers. Most child care staff in this country earn around $12,000 a year with few, if any, benefits. Even when they have excellent training and a BA, they still have low wages. Because of these low wages, a third of childcare workers leave their jobs every year, which can be damaging to young children. We heard them on the video. Young children need stable care. In addition, last year, more than half the states required little or no training for child care staff before they started work. We're going to close that gap. Under the new Child Care Development Fund, all states using federal funds are now required to provide basic health and safety training. To prevent SIDS deaths in child care settings, working with Mrs. Gore, our department is educating child care workers about the importance of putting infants to sleep on their backs and the importance of telling parents to do the same. We believe that all child care centers that are receiving federal funds should have to make sure that children are immunized. And as I said, we consider this conference to be our seventh inning stretch. But reaching the end of the game will be very tough. It means making sure that all parents have the information and the personal assistance they need to make one of the toughest decisions of their lives. It means that making sure that states don't have to make impossible trade-offs when choosing which children are eligible, how much parents must pay, 
and how much child care providers are reimbursed. And it means making sure that parents don't ever have to make impossible trade-offs, either trade-offs between keeping their jobs and keeping their children safe. As the other panelists have made clear, it's only going to happen if all of us continue to share information and invest resources. And that's only going to happen if we judge ourselves, not on what we say today, but what all of us do tomorrow. Mr. President, Mrs. Clinton, we can do it. I was glad to hear what you said about not being able to sit still after 3 o'clock. <laughs> I'm glad to know you've been sitting still before 3 o'clock. I didn't know. <laughs> I have never seen you still for two minutes in all of our acquaintance. This is amazing. Let, let me, you don't, I don't think you can answer this now, but I think it's quite important that we be explicit about a dilemma that we will face as we move toward next year, the State of the Union, what our position ought to be. We all know that there will be, a, in the context of the budget agreement we just adopted, fierce competition for limited money. We're going to have some more money to put into this. We will do the very best we can. It will be a priority, but still, it seems to me that, that there will be, a, you know, competition for what the best way the federal government can spend more money in child care is. We could uh, increase the, the tax credit to either make it more generous to people who get it now or move it up in the income limits. We could expand Head Start, particularly the zero to three program where it, we've only got just a few thousand kids now. I can't, 25,000 or something. And, and I think the early results are pretty promising. It's a terribly important initiative. Or we could devise some way to help get these salaries up, which is, you know, abysmal. When you were talking about the salaries, Hillary gave me a chart which showed that child care workers on the whole are better educated than the American workforce and lower paid. So we could keep saying we would want all these people to come in and get more education and more training, and yet, and there are some cases where people don't have any education or training, but there are a lot of them that are quite well educated that are working for uh, ridiculously limited wages. So what's your sense about uh, how we ought to go about making that decision? And I'll just give a, a blanket invitation to the audience, too, that if you were in my position and you knew you couldn't do 100% of all these things, would you do a little bit of all of them? Would you focus on one? Would you focus on the other? And I invite you to make your views known to us uh, either today during the conference or in writing because this will be a difficult thing. If Congressman Lampson's still here, he's going to have to make a decision about how to vote on this stuff, and we will have to decide. Mr. President, I, th I think that all of us would say to you, we have to invest resources in quality. Start with the basics, health, safety, and, in, and encouraging a good learning environment. Focus on the caregiver. Start uh, the, with the care of our youngest children and also our school age children, but it has to be a quality agenda. That's where the weakness is in the system, and focusing on those caregivers is going to be very important in the future. Thank you, Donna. Well, someone who has uh, been doing just that is Governor Hunt, uh, who has uh, an initiative that he will describe to us called Smart Start, uh, which for those of us who have followed uh, this work on behalf of uh, children around the country see as one of the best models of best practices that we could hold up to the rest of the country. And so, Governor Hunt, would you share that experience with us, please? Thank you, Mrs. Clinton. I, I first of all want to say that uh, Mr. President, that uh, the American people care a whole lot more about this than they do most of the stuff the press asks you about in this city, and I want you to remember that. Now, as we've got you on film today. <laughs> as the President and Mrs. Clinton know, uh, because we served uh, in governorships together, um, I served as governor of our state from the mid-70s to the mid-80s. I worked hard on education, and education reform, and jobs, and protecting the public, and a lot of things. I was in the private sector for eight years, and I thought a lot about why things aren't working better. Why aren't schools more successful? 
Why isn't our workforce more productive and innovative and doing higher value work and things like that? Let me tell you where I came out. The major problem is the first five years of life. Now, there are no panaceas. This comes closer to being one, if you get those years right, than anything else. I know it's the, the case for schools. You give children the kinds of opportunities and love and care, all we've heard about here today, in those first five years, and our schools will just zoom. There's no question about it. I literally ran for governor in 1992 after being in the private sector where I frankly would like to perhaps to stay. It was very, <laughs> a lot of good things about it. But I ran for governor because I wanted to see us change things. I wanted to see us make things work. And I have decided that that's the most important thing to do. So I ran for office on this issue. I gave an inaugural address in 1993 on it, working with Dan Blue, our state legislative leader here, Speaker of the House, uh, we put the Smart Start program through our legislature, and my wife Carolyn and I here are going to spend, are spending our, uh, these eight years working on it. Now let me tell you what I think are the, are the essential components of making it work. First of all, you really have to focus on it. You're doing that today, and you've done it as long as I've known both of you. And I know all of you here today are doing it too. But we have to focus on it, folks, like a laser. We have got to get people thinking about it. There's so many other things out there that preoccupy us. There are all the special groups that want you to focus on their issues. We've got to focus on this one. Leaders have to focus on this one. And we have to get other people to do it. Let me tell you, I never give a speech when I don't talk about it. Some people are getting fed up with hearing me talk about it. <laughs> well, they're going to keep hearing me talk about it. And furthermore, we're, we're getting a lot of things done. And we've got to stay with it and stay with it and stay with it. Now, how do we approach it? I've heard wonderful things today about what we need. Let me say to you, we need a systematic approach. I love a lot of these great pilot projects. I want to see a, a systematic approach that works for every kid across my state and across yours. Don't just give me a pilot project that works. I think there are two things essential to that. First of all, we really as states, and certainly as a nation, but we do these things primarily as states as we do our schools, we need to have an approach. I don't want to say a system. That sounds like it's government, because I think a public-private partnership is the real key to this. But we need to have a systematic approach so all of our kids are going to get it. And all of our kids are going to get quality. Second, we need to root it in the local community. Now, that's where the good things are out. That's where the churches are, and the synagogues, and the businesses, and the schools, and everything else. They're out there in the local communities. Lots of people who care, who are good at it. We gotta knit them together. We gotta have an approach to this thing and we gotta keep those local people able to do it. Invite them to do it. It's gotta be easy for them to do it. We gotta cut out that turfism. We gotta cut out those kids who are falling through the gaps. The local people can do that. So what we did was we, we established a public-private partnership. We established what we call the North Carolina Partnership for Children. That's the official name. We call it Smart Start. It is a 501c3. We have the state board, headed generally by top business leaders. We have all the right folks on there. We've got the parents on there, and the business leaders, and the church leaders, and the social service leaders, and the educators, and the health folks, and so on. They're all at the table. Then we replicate that within each of our 100 counties. They're all at the table. We've cut out the turfism. and these people never talked to each other before. And now they're working together and they're sharing together. What do they do? Three things. First of all, the first thing they do, they have to do this before they get the money. They got to do a survey. What are the needs for our children? Second, what are the resources we have to meet those needs? Third, what do we need to do now? What should our approach be in our county? All of these people now planning and working on this together. 
So that's sort of the, 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 the approach that we, by the way, as they have made their own individual plans, Mrs. Clinton, they have varied. In one county, Stanley County near Charlotte, they decided that if a parent wanted to stay home the first year, they'd give them a modest amount of money for diapers and formula and so forth, $1,000 to $1,500. That isn't much money. A lot of parents decided to stay home that first year. I think it's a great idea. Some of the editorialists criticize it. Hey, they want to do it, and it's working for them. We ought to give people the flexibility to come up with better ideas like that. Third thing I want to say to you is that business is just crucial to this. Business folks can get a lot of things done that we in government can't get done. So we need their leadership. We need to get chambers of commerce to endorse this, and they will. We need to get business folks to co-chair or chair these boards. Fourth thing I want to say to you is something about the goals. Every kid who needs it, who needs something better, needs to get it, and it's got to have real quality. The danger is that we have them somewhere, but they aren't getting what they need for their brains, for their hearts, for all of this that you all have talked about and that you know so well. Now, uh, let, me, let, me, let me tell you how I think you think about this. We wouldn't think about school starting in the fall and 10 or 20 percent of our kids couldn't get a good public education, would we? And yet that's exactly what's happening with kids zero to five. And that is morally wrong. And we've got to change it. So we've got to have a systematic approach that enables us to do that. That quality care, of course, requires all kinds of dollars, and it means we've got to focus on the teachers. We have an effort in our state, a scholarship program called TEACH. That means teacher education and compensation helps. We've had 5,000 people go through it and get this training. And uh, the, the, their employer has to agree that when you come back, you're, I mean, when you finish it, you're, they probably continue to work and they get this as they do it. You get a 10, at least a 10% increase in your wages. And for most of them, it's a lot more than that. And of course, we had that great turnover. We had people low paid, and they still are in large measure. But we're really changing it. And that's the kind of thing, and I'm thrilled to hear your announcement today about that, Mr. President. Now, let me say to you, a lot of states are doing great things. Uh, the NGA has made this a major focus. Rob Reiner has spoken to the last two national governor's conferences. That tells you how focused they are. They have a, uh, Governor Voinovich has an NGA children's task force, and we've got efforts in places like Indiana, New Jersey, and Colorado uh, focusing on coordinated efforts and quality enhancement in Vermont and Illinois business leadership uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Florida and other places. So governors are really beginning to do this, and it's the big new thing that's coming along that they're focusing on. I want to say one final thing. Mr. President, we need you to use that bully pulpit that you use better than any person who's ever served here on this issue every time you can. Second, we need a lot more dollars, and I'll take them anywhere I can get them. <laughs> and third, Mrs. Clinton, we need you to visit America more. We want you to come to sites. We want you to look at systems. We want you to interact with all these folks, including business folks. We want you to be out at state conferences. We need to have a lot more of those in states around the country. And we need, to talk, we need you to talk about the community that it takes to raise a child. You have more credibility on it than any person in this country. You're right, and the American people know it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I agree with the last thing you said, for sure. <laughs> Let me say, the reason I wanted Governor Hunt to come here today, apart from our 20 years of friendship and my immense admiration for him, and, is that the, 
if I could go back to the question I asked Secretary Rubin. Great trick we have with all great social questions in America is that we know that government can't solve alone, either because we don't have the resources or the capacity, is how to have grassroots, community-based partnerships that still, when the, end, when the day is over, add up to a system that serves everybody. Instead of just makes nice touching stories, we can all tell each other at seminars till kingdom come. And that is what they have done in North Carolina. They have kept the entrepreneurial spirit. They have the partnership. They've cobbled money together from first one place to another, and he's put a lot of new money in it. And because he has taken this initiative and set up a framework within which creativity and partnership can flourish, they have a system. And I still believe that, I'll say again, I think that is the great sort of the challenge that America faces that goes across so many of our problems and plainly relates to this. The only question I wanted to ask you about it that I'd like you to specifically uh, address is, do you have enough money to deal with the dilemma that raising quality uh, standards must increase your cost to some extent, and does that price anybody out of it? And if not, why not? Mr. President, we don't have enough money. Now, uh, we think that'll get us pretty close to quality for, for, for kids, but it may not be enough and costs go up. It is terribly hard to get the resources. That's why we've got to understand how important this is. You can't do this on the cheap. You really can't. That's why we need businesses' help, we need everybody's help, we need the in-kind, you know, churches providing the places, and we need all the federal money we can get, Mr. President. Well, you know, just one other thing I'd like to say that I, that I, I think we ought to consider, this is a little thing, but if you, you talked about the bully pulpit, I think a lot of people are just plain old-fashioned ignorant about what's involved in being an effective, successful child care worker would be surprised at the edu average educational level of child care workers in America and the average pay. And I think that we ought, one of the things that we ought to do with this bully pulpit idea of yours is start uh, trying to find ways that every community and every state can honor outstanding child care workers the same way we honor teachers today, or scientists, or others. Because I, I think that's terribly important. I, I just don't think society I don't think they mean to devalue people in this work. I just think they don't know most people. Mr. President, if I may, last year, Mrs. Hunt and I had a statewide gala banquet, 1,200 people or so, in the state capitol to present the awards to the top child care givers, like top teachers. And they came from all over the state. And we had the winners in every county. We need to really start doing that, showing our appreciation, holding these people up telling how important this is. We've, we've done it some for schools, not nearly enough. You're gonna honor teachers tomorrow right here. But we need to do it for child care givers, the most important teachers in the world. I don't think you can underestimate how important it is for people to say to other people that they matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, if it matters in your personal life, it's gotta matter in all these other areas too. I think it's a big issue. Well, I just wanna thank Governor Hunt for his example because um, uh, one of our hopes is through this conference to highlight uh, what states are doing. He mentioned some of the other states that have very uh, good practices and are expanding the supply of uh, affordable quality child care. I know that the President fought very hard to put into the Welfare Reform Act uh, that there be a provision that would set aside a portion of federal child care dollars to improve quality. Uh, in the states, and that's a very important uh, aspect of what we hope states are going to be able to do. I'd like now to turn to someone who is very knowledgeable about what communities are doing to address child care needs uh, around the country, uh, and that is uh, Dr. Washington, who's with the uh, W.K. Kellogg Foundation that has a long-standing interest uh, in this issue and has worked very hard uh, on many fronts in trying to uh, improve uh, conditions in the child care system. Dr. Washington. Thank you. Like everybody else here today, I really want to commend this effort to focus national attention on child care. 
What we've just heard from Governor Hunt is a stellar example, I believe, of the state's strong capacity for innovative experiments. And what's really special about the way North Carolina is doing it is the way that it extends down to the local level. In this way, North Carolina and many other states are well equipped to promote that goal of quality child care that we've heard so much about today. States really can take the lead in designing a child care infrastructure that reflects the distinctive strengths that are unique to that state. To a large extent, child care in the United States has largely been the province of the state and the federal governments. The federal role that we're still asking for more today is helping to promote the issue of affordability. According to the GAO, there were more than 90 federal funding programs for child care administered by 11 agencies in 1994, and these include direct subsidy programs such as Head Start, as well as tax-based subsidies that help working parents to recoup some of their uh, cost and also encourage employers to help their employees with child care expenses. But even as many people continue to debate this issue, I think that we need to acknowledge today that the fact is that we as a nation have already decided to support child care with public funds. Even though we keep seeing the editorials about this, we've already made that decision to support child care with public funds. We also have already decided that child care support should help everybody. We're already doing that through tax subsidies as well as direct subsidies. But even though these decisions have already been made, we've made them with some ambivalence. And that's why I'm particularly grateful to the President and Mrs. Clinton for helping us to think creatively and more incrementally about how we're going to have this next generation of support for child care. What is missing is not the decision to support child care, not the decision to have child care for everybody, but what's missing as we come to this landmark dialogue today is the commitment to increase the federal state and local. You've heard it today, but I have to emphasize, it's going to take every sector of society, administration, Congress, business, community, religious leaders, state and local officials, as well as parents and providers to respond effectively to the child care challenge. Other speakers have illustrated the federal and state action. I'd like to talk about the important role of community and local governments who have generally played a smaller role in the past. I'm encouraged, though, because a number of experiments funded by the Kellogg Foundation and many others show that there is an increasing number of communities who are coming together to jumpstart this kind of change. Innovations and investments in child care have the best chance of succeeding when they're supported by a consensus within the broader community that children and families are a top priority. Only then will community members in the public and the private sectors alike devote the time, energy, and resources required to create that truly caring community for children. Cities and states already know how important child care is. According to a survey of the National League of Cities, child care is at the center of state plans for welfare reform, for example. But very much aware of the need to engage community dialogue, in 1994, a coalition of Michigan grant makers joined forces to jumpstart dialogue by bringing together national and child care experts with diverse teams representing a wide variety of local communities. We've done this not just in Michigan, but in many communities around the United States. Over the years, what we found is by bringing people together in local communities, we broadened the state and local leadership networks and encouraged communities in the processes that they need to build their capacity to provide child care. These efforts also create a synergy which improve the climate for stimulating child care locally and in the state. I'd like to share briefly four critical lessons that we've learned from community strategies and what communities are doing to address the child care issue. The first thing that successful community strategies do is they get everybody involved. Child care professionals, parents, and providers cannot do it alone. If we could, we would have done it already. We need everybody in the community to get involved in this conversation and to understand how important childcare is, and successful community strategies do that. 
Second of all, successful community strategies encourage each sector to bring their own value and strength to the table. Again, we need more than child care knowledge in order to build an effective child care system at the local and state levels. We also find, third, that successful communities have to be willing to take a look at themselves. That is harder than it seems because you've already heard the data that there's a lot of mediocre and some bad child care out there. I mentioned earlier that the federal government is helping us to address this goal of affordability. We see states like North Carolina helping to address this issue of quality. What communities and local governments are best equipped to address, I think, are the needs of availability. Obviously, there's a lot of synergy that goes on between affordability, quality, and availability. But communities are uniquely situated to address the child care needs of their own residents, and these needs vary from town to town. Communities conduct needs assessment, they launch planning initiatives, they ensure that parents know where to get the information they need, and they help to encourage increased supply of child care because they know what's needed in their community. Successful communities have to be willing to take a look at themselves. And fourth, we find that successful communities developed concrete action plans. You have to know what you want to achieve. You have to focus on goals and identify critical issues. Build on your community assets. You've got to work for specific indicators of success. For those of you who think that what I just said is a boilerplate and everybody knows that, believe me, that is not always happening. We've got to work for specific results. So successful communities get everybody involved. They value the diversity that people bring to the table. They assess themselves and they make specific plans that work for concrete results. There's a few challenges that we've noticed that communities run into when they're trying to reform and improve their child care situations. The first is the difficulty but the necessity of preserving child care diversity. We have got to maintain choice in our local communities. We cannot use the coming together as a community as an opportunity to make a cookie cutter approach that we then ask parents to join or to choose. The second challenge that comes up is the whole issue of cost. We can no longer sidestep this issue. Cost is very critical and we have to close the gap between quality and what parents can afford to pay. A third major challenge is engaging the majority. The majority are the people who don't have children themselves at home. We have to let them know in the community at a local level what child care means to them. A next challenge is the need to clear, more clearly articulate the outcomes and results that the community can expect to achieve and get in return for its investment. So they'll buy into this continuum of care. And the biggest challenge that I see that communities face is the whole application of knowledge. You know that we know so much more than we do. We already know about how important group size is. We already know about the training of providers. We know that child care providers need to be better paid. We know that crime goes up in the after school hours. We know, but we do not do. This application of knowledge is the big challenge facing the local communities. We're going to have to ask ourselves in everything we do, are we looking through the eyes of the child and putting their needs and interests first? Are we doing what we know works, focusing on solutions that are available right now? Are we bringing more accountability into the system? Are we looking at concrete results and outcomes for children? These are the kinds of questions that local communities are struggling with and grappling with. And I really want to thank you again for bringing this to the attention of the American people. Dr. Washington, that was an excellent um, analysis of uh, what we're confronting. 
And what would be your advice about how um, the president, governors, all of us who are concerned about this issue uh, could do more to engage communities uh, in this discussion uh, where either the community themselves or the leadership of the community don't think they have any particular stake uh, in trying to uh, pursue the sort of process that you outlined and that Governor Hunt uh, has put into practice in North Carolina? Well, as we've all heard today, we all benefit from quality child care. We've got to get the word out that child care is a collective good. That's why the federal role and the state role and the local role is so important. Child care is a collective good that doesn't just benefit the people who receive the service, the children and the families themselves, but it gives benefits that accrue to the whole society. That's what we've heard the secretary speak to. We've got to get this message out in our communities. Child care is a collective good. We all benefit from child care. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to go to our final speaker of the morning who um, will talk about what is probably the most valuable and important perspective, that of parents. Uh, Patty Siegel is the executive director of the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network, and she has been involved in the grassroots work that is done in trying to answer the questions that parents ask themselves about child care. Uh, she was involved in creating Trustline, a system in California for checking the backgrounds of child care providers. Uh, she has a lot of experience in helping parents evaluate what is good child care. Uh, and Patty, we'd appreciate your talking about how parents feel about this and what parents can do to help themselves and what others can do to help empower parents. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clinton, and thank you, President Clinton. This is an exciting morning, and I'm pleased to say that the view from the front lines of child care, which are actually more than 600 local child care resource and referral agencies across the country who talked just in the morning in each agency probably to more than 30 or 40 parents from all income levels looking for child care. I'm happy to say that what we hear on the phone lines are exactly the themes that you and the president and every speaker this morning has referred to. So perhaps my remarks might really be a sum up of what everyone else has said and the good news is that you are on track that each of you this morning understands the enormous complexity and challenge and anxiety of America's parents as they search for childcare. And Kathy really summed it up very well in the very beginning. In childcare resource and referral, and this is work that really started for me as a much younger parent with my own three children under three, two of whom are twins, and I had a really hard time finding childcare. Like Michelle Seligson, I was in a co-op but instead of going on to start a child care center, as Mickey did, I started a child care switchboard because I knew from all the parents on the waiting list in my little play group that it was really hard to find child care, and especially hard for those of us that had very young children under two. And so the heart of the work that I've been involved in these past 25 years, and my twins are exactly 25 years old, the heart of our work is really helping families find and choose the childcare that best meets their individual and particular needs. And Mrs. Clinton, you asked earlier this morning, what can we do to help parents? And one of the things we can do is make sure that this basic childcare information is available to every parent that needs it, not just in the 600 communities where it now exists, but everywhere and in a way that's very accessible. We need to be in churches. We need not just to be on those phone lines. We need to be out in the community with our laptops, helping people to understand all the available resources. Now, in order to make those connections, we have to keep track of the supply of childcare. We have to be in an intimate relationship with the childcare providers in our community, all of them from all sectors. And what we know from this work over years and years is what everyone has said this morning. There's not enough, it's often inadequate, it's not available to many parents close to where they work or close to where they live, and so we've developed the resource side of our service to really work on filling those gaps, 
to looking at the supply, to adding up our numbers and sharing them back with the community, but also <coughs> using it as a sort of pointer to ourselves to say, where do we need to really focus our attentions to develop the supply of infant toddler care? Where are the gaps in service and how can we best meet those and how can we engage people like the public and private sectors. And I'm proud to say that in California, for the last 12 years, we've had a very successful public-private partnership where we've brought together the state of California and many, many corporations and foundations to help us build a supply of quality licensed family childcare. And because these stories are so incredible and because we really have the privilege of hearing from parents every day what's going on and hearing from providers the struggles and the fragility of their situation. I look in the audience and I see Doug Baird from Associated Daycare in Boston. I see Deborah Eaton, a fantastic family child care provider from California, Peggy Hack uh, from Wisconsin. All of them run great programs, but they will tell you what they tell us, they're fragile. They could fall apart on a moment's notice and they call us saying, we need a substitute, we can't find a director, et cetera, et cetera. I think that you've heard the challenges from everyone, affordability, availability. We hear it most from parents with tiny babies, and I have to tell you that when I started 25 years ago, it wasn't such a common place that parents called us when a baby was three or four weeks old. But now that is the way it is for most working families. They have to get back to work in a hurry, and I do hope you'll be able to expand the family and medical leave so that parents have a little longer because they want longer. It is hard to get back to work right away. But they can't afford it, you've heard that. For babies in my own state, over two thirds of all our licensed childcare is in childcare centers. And yet, of that two thirds, only 4% of those spaces are available to babies. So that means that any parent with a tiny baby is, has to look out to the family child care providers, to the license exempt providers, it means that there simply isn't a supply for the tiniest babies in this country, and that is an incredible problem. If you ever wanted to create an instant community, just bring together a sample of parents like the ones I've spoken to in the last 24 hours while I traveled from California to Washington the flight attendants. I have to say, I spent 10 minutes last night in the, on the plane talking to flight attendants about the incredible dilemmas of their work schedules, how they change. The waitress who brought me my dinner last night in the hotel, who works two jobs so that she can be home with her baby. The engineer who I sat next to on the plane, whose two-year-old son has cerebral palsy and simply cannot find a provider who is willing to take care of him. This is just a small sample, but if you look at these individuals and then add on to their already, to the frustrations they already face, finding quality childcare, if you add on affordability, which everyone has talked about, but I have to tell you again that if people cannot afford childcare, there is no childcare choice. Let's not kid ourselves this morning. Affordability is key to moving forward in any quality system. And right now in California, a working mother, a low-income working mother making minimum wage, if she has a child under two, she would be paying not the 25% that everyone has quoted. In California, she would pay 68% of her minimum wage income to find childcare for that baby. So you can understand, all of you, why we desperately need an infusion of public support. Because those low-income women can't make, they can't make ends meet and they will not be successful in their economic independence without additional resources. And sadly, as so many people have repeated this morning, the wonderful people who we should honor, and I think all anyone in this room who is a child care provider should stand up, we should honor you, but we honor you by paying you. It's, and, we need this kind of partnership. We need the dedicated people who love their jobs, who want to do the right thing. But if the training that they need is available 100 miles away, 
if it costs more than they can afford, and most of all, if they can't earn a living wage. If they can't make more than $7 an hour, why would they want to stay in this profession? And I have to say that for many of us with young adult children who are thinking about careers in early childhood education, one wonders if they'll ever be able to leave home if they choose this <laughs> profession to work in. I'd like to close this morning with an image, and it's an image that's very American. Over the past 50 years, childcare in America has become a patchwork quilt that's been stitched together hurriedly and without too much intentional design, without a border to keep the squares in place. My hope and the hope of all the parents on the other end of our phone lines and all the providers that we connect to is that we will create a childcare quilt and system in this country that has a deliberate design, is planned and carried out with attention to detail, like the quilts we treasure and pass on from generation to generation, warm enough and strong enough and beautiful enough to keep our children safe and healthy and ready to learn, and made in the best and greatest American quilting bee tradition of working together to create the best possible product. Thank you so much for helping us start that year. Well, that is, I think, an extraordinary uh, way to wrap up our morning session. I can't think of anything that could be added to what you said. But if you think about what uh, all of our last uh, speakers said, it, it amounts to a plea to us to do what we can to both increase the coherence and, and completeness of community-based action within a framework that creates a system that involves all our children. And uh, again, I, let me say to all of you involved in this work, I am profoundly grateful to you. I thank you for being here today. This has been an immensely uh, enlightening day to me. I have been struggling to understand this issue, uh, especially since uh, one day several years ago, I had, we all have our little epiphanies in life about these matters, but Hillary had been talking to me about child care for years, and one day when I was running for governor, more than well over a decade ago, I used to make a habit in every election season of going to the earliest plant gate in my state because the workers came to work between 4.30 and 5.30. And even the, the uh, vote hungriest politicians wouldn't get up that early. <laughs> so I always had them all to myself. <laughs> and I never will forget one day I came home, I told Hillary, I said, you won't believe what happened to me at a quarter to five this morning. This, uh, I was at the Campbell Soup plant in North Arkansas and I, this pickup truck rolled up. And uh, as often happened, the husbands and wives, one was taking the other to work and they would come up in the dark and kiss each other goodbye. And, so this pickup truck came up and this lady leaned over and kissed her husband goodbye and opened the door and the light came on and inside were three children under the age of five. And so I went over and talked to the young man when his wife went into work at a quarter to five. I said, what are you doing with these kids? I mean, how do you do this? He said, well, I have to, we got to get them up every morning at quarter to four. And we dress them up, and he said, and I said, uh, he said, I keep them as long as I can, but I have to be at work at 7. So I had to find somebody who would take care of them at 6.30. Three kids under five. But he said, we've got three kids under five. We both have to work. Now, there are millions of stories like that, and they're no less gripping for the parents than those who don't have quite such strange circumstances. But it is inconceivable to me that we have had all of you wonderful people working at this and we put all this money in it and we still never developed a systematic approach or in the words of Patty, a quilt that everybody can be a part of and that I think we should all leave as our mission. Thank you very much. take a lunch break now and for all of those who are watching this on satellite um, 
We will reconvene here this afternoon, but I also want to thank uh, the members of the Cabinet who will be hosting uh, the afternoon sessions at uh, several departments, Secretary Glickman at Agriculture, uh, Secretary Herman at Labor, Secretary Shalala, uh, and Secretary Rubin. Uh, and I know that there will be similar meetings uh, around the country, and then we will, those of us here in the White House, uh, reconvene again for our afternoon panels uh, after lunch. Thank you all very much. Hi, Dave. Thank you. I do appreciate you very much.